early um, on <clears throat> in, in uh, kind of my, my ministerial, I, I, I got a, when I got married, I got a job because you've got to feed the family, right? And you've got to provide housing and so on. And so I had this period of time when um, I was not a pastor, and, but when I became one, and then I kind of fell into something that honestly is a little bit like embarrassing to even tell you about, but I kind of fell into this, this culture of how you dress and how you look was really, really important. And um, um, I was with a, a group of people, associated with a group of people at the time that put a lot of thinking into that, um, um, suits, I'm not a suit guy. I don't know if you knew that or not, but you know the proper, proper tie, proper suit, proper this, proper that, hanky in the pocket, this whole thing, in order to look good. In order to look good. I remember when um, we was going to an event, and I heard the story of a, of a colleague of mine who had ordered a brand new car, and was really, really upset because his car didn't arrive in time to bring it to this event to show people. So it was really kind of a showing thing. You know, it was more like, like um, how, how I look is really important. The, the problem with that is you probably know, and maybe are sitting there thinking that it wasn't so much, it, the, the focus has shifted away from why we were gathering together to like, hey, <laughs> look at me, you know, check out this color, this tie, and this type of thing. Now, admittedly, some of us took more work than others in order to look okay, but nonetheless, that was just a passion that, it was so easy to get caught up in, you know. And um, it, it was a part of my life, at least for a, a, a period of time. Um, we're gathering here today. I'm going to talk about that in just a, a few moments. And when we have come together, whether we're online or wherever we are, we've, we've done so by bringing our different stories to this place, haven't we? So um, our different journeys, our different stories. So here, here's maybe what that looked like for you this week. For some of us, it's been really, really hard. It's been a bit of a challenge. I mean, you've, you've had decisions that you're trying to make and you just you seem like conflicted in, in all of that. You, you know, it's hard to make that decision. Or for some of us, you know, the, our, our money, our funds just didn't go far enough. And, and maybe in reality, what you did is you found yourself, you know, putting something back on the shelf because it's just not, we just can't afford that. Or maybe, you know, clicking off the gas pump at a certain amount of dollars because, you know, we just don't have that much money. And that's been your challenge in life. Or for some of us, maybe it's a health challenge or something like that. When we come to this place, bring all kinds of stories and journeys and experiences. And for some of us, it was the very, very best, best part of our week. But we come uh, together for one purpose, and that's to worship Jesus. And that's the most amazing thing about when we gather like we are today. And it's one of the reasons why it's honestly one of my most favorite um, days of the week, my most favorite day of the week, um, besides getting up with my wife, we know, which is always a favorable thing, but it's my most favorite day of the, of the, of the week of gathering together and worshiping Jesus. Not because it just happens to be like, I gotta be here, but I get to be here. And so when the church comes together, um, different people, different experiences, different talents, different gifts, it's a beautiful thing, amen? And so look at the person beside you and go like, you're a beautiful thing, you know, right? That you are gathering today. This is a beautiful event that we get to be a part of. And I wanna talk about that today. Okay, that's enough. You're not that beautiful. Okay, so, no, I'm just kidding. All right, all right. So, um, but in this series called Truth Matters, right, and where you get your truth matters, I, I just feel like it's really important that we, that we include what we're about, who we are, what we're about as we navigate this thing called, called life. And so our theme verse, and I prayed your theme verse, is from Psalm 25, verse 5, guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. So I've mentioned before that this is both a prayer and a commitment. So we lift our prayer to God, to God, please guide me in life. And as you do, as I seek your truth, as you reveal your truth to me, I commit to that truth because where, uh, truth matters and where you get your truth matters. And so I want to talk about us today and the church that, 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 that gathers. 
The church gathers for just two things. It's not to show off your car or, or nothing, anything else or your brand new this or your brand new that. The church gathers to worship and to glorify God. That is why we gather. So if you have your fill-in sheet, you're going to see that blank there somewhere. If you didn't pick one up, you can do so as you leave. There's some resources there, and we also fill in all the blanks for you people who have to have every blank filled in and post that online. So I pray that this, this is both your your passion to worship Jesus and to glorify him. It's truly a miracle when you consider who we are. Some of us have come from maybe what we would describe as rough, rough backgrounds or different backgrounds. Some of us grew up in Christian homes and some of us did not. But when we consider that we have brought all these experiences together and we do so with this passion to worship and glorify the one true God, it is truly a miracle. And we should, we should rejoice in that, I think. Last week, we talked about life matters and the issue of the sanctity of life, um, where we stand as a church. And next, next week, talking about sexuality, biblical sexuality, and the challenges we face today. And I just trust that parents will decide if your students should be in here or not. We'll be talking about sex and matters related to that from a biblical perspective. So that's, that's next Sunday. But before we get there, I just felt like it was important for us to talk about the church from a biblical worldview. Now, you know, if you can just visualize in your mind, because they're not going to come up on the screen today, a biblical worldview always begins with what does the Bible Say So some of you have been, ga been tracking with that. So what does the Bible say? That's, that's that center circle, right? What the Bible says forms my beliefs. That's the next circle. What the Bible uh, says forms my beliefs, and then my beliefs form my values, and then my values form my behavior. A little bit more on that in just a moment. A biblical worldview begins with the Bible and impacts every area of my life. Every belief Every value I embrace and how I live those out or my behavior. So my behavior always reflects my beliefs and always reflects my values. My behavior is what's observed by others. So when others look at you and, and your behavior, they will know, they will observe your beliefs because your behavior is a reflection of what you believe and what you hold is true or what, what, what you value. Beliefs and values are expressed in behavior. So how I behave reflects my beliefs. So years ago, I had a friend who um, his behavior didn't quite match um, his, his um, beliefs that he, that he shared. So I, God, God's the judge, right? We'll leave that up to him. But his behavior was such that other people... Um, began to go like, if, if that's a Christian, if that's how a Christian acts, like I don't want any part of it. Do you see the disconnect? So if our behavior doesn't reflect our beliefs or our, you know, what we proclaim to be true, there's a problem and others pick that out pretty, pretty quickly, specifically, particularly those who are outside the faith. So the question is this morning, why is it necessary to begin with the Bible and not some really good book on life? Because there are some really good books on life. Yes, I read them and, and you read them. And so that's a really, really good question. Why do we begin with the Bible? Are there good books that help us to understand and navigate life? The answer is yes. But there is only one inspired, authoritative word of God that does not change, and that's the Bible. I mean, if you just pick up a book on any topic today and a book on that same topic, you know, years ago, you're going to find that re views change, um, 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 theories change, but the Bible does not change. It's the authoritative, inspired word of God. And the importance and absolute necessity to have an anchor today cannot be overstated because there's so much shifting and moving around that's going on in the world today. I don't know if you have noticed that or not. That's why we're talking about the things that we are talking about because things are shifting. But what about you and me? So it can't be overstated. You and I need an anchor and the Bible, the unchanging inspired word of God is our anchor. So the Bible is both an anchor 
and a guide, an anchor and a guide. The Bible becomes our anchor in all of life. And so you know and I know that the anchor holds us in one place, yes? Yeah, it, it holds us. It keeps us there. It keeps us from drifting. It keeps us from just like floating about willy-nilly. That's what the anchor does. And so years ago when I was working, um, no, I'm working now, but years ago when I was working not as a, as a pastor, but in, in, a, in, in a job, I was at a refinery uh, and I was in the shipping and receiving part. So we would load container ships and load barges with fuel that that, that time was, I don't know, a buck a gallon or maybe less than that. So, um, but there was this one ship. It was amazing what happened when he would come. And so, I mean, I'm talking about a ship. I'm, I'm talking like a great big, like a big ship. Okay, a big one. So filled with thousands of barrels of gasoline that we would, we would do. Big ship. So um, when, when, when uh, typically when um, a ship like that comes in, you know, I think somewhere around Port Angeles, they would pick up a pilot, right? Because a pilot knows about where, you know, the big rocks are or whatever and where you have to go. Well, this guy um, was a pilot. He didn't need to pick up anybody. He did it himself. I don't remember his first name. All I can visually, though, he was this old salty guy with long white hair, which I appreciated. Um, and so he'd done it so many times, he could do this on his own. But usually what would happen when these ships or these barges would come in, there would be a tug attached to them, right, to guide them in and to help them up into the dock and so on so we could, we could load them. Not this guy. I mean, he would bring this big ship in. He didn't have a tug. He had nothing but, but his knowledge of what to do. And here's what he would do. I watched it. He'd come around the corner pretty soon out there um, and watch him dock on the inside berth, which was much more challenging. So, he, so he'd come around, and all of a sudden I heard it, and look out there, he drops an anchor. He dropped the anchor, that ship would turn just exactly where he wanted it. He'd pick up that anchor, and he'd come in a little bit further, and he would drop the other anchor, and he'd bring it in like this. And then he'd come around the corner, and by dropping and pulling anchors, he literally guided that ship to the inside berth where, where we docked it. Do you get the visual there? See, our anchor is our guide in all of life. So we commit to the Bible guiding us as our anchor in all of life, no matter what the issue that we might be facing today. So what is it that you're facing? A challenge of some type? The Bible is our guide. What is it that you're facing? Um, joy in life? The Bible's our, our guide. What is it that you're experiencing? The Bible is our guide in all life. Of life. So I want to talk about church. Now, here's the deal. Um, um, it's like the old adage, you know, like you're speaking to the choir, which obviously I am because you're here and you're here online. But I want to talk about why the church matters. And I believe it's a message that we need to be reminded of again, maybe to kind of pull us into center just a little bit, maybe to anchor us just a little bit. But I believe it's important that we define church and that we do so from a biblical understanding and recognize what our responsibility is to those inside the church and responsibility to those outside the church. Because we come and gather here, and what I often refer to as a faith community, we, we are the inside people, but we have a responsibility and a call to those outside the church, those in the community, more on that in just a little bit. So are we just another club? You know, the answer is no. So are we just another club, a resounding no? And so that's why I say we are different than the really good clubs like Rotary and like um, Lions Club and a few others around who do really, really good things. But I've said this way before, that this church, the church of God, the church of Christ um, and Gateway, and I've said it this way, we are not called first to feed people and clothe people. We do these things because I believe that the, the, the Bible mandates that we do these things as a result of our faith and passion and desire to share the gospel story with those outside the church and in the community so they are a means to an end. If all we did is feed people and all we did is clothe people, that would be a really good thing, but we would miss the purpose of the church and that's to share the good news of the, of the gospel. So the church, who are we? 
Who are we to be? And then why does that matter? So kind of visualize in your mind these three circles, which I'm not going to put up on the screen today, but the center circle is always what does the Bible, what does the Bible say? So when we talk about the biblical worldview about, about the church, and then how are my beliefs formed? How are my values formed? And what about my behavior? So that's what we're going to talk about. So very first thing, that center circle, what does the Bible say? Who are we? Who is the church? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Um, The church is Christ's body. Hang on to that for just a moment. But let me open the lens up a little bit on the book of Ephesians, written by Paul. He's in, he's in prison, and he's writing really about God's plan to humanity and, and, and shares what we can call Christian disciplines or Christian practices that enable believers or followers of Jesus like you and me to grow and to mature in, in Christ. That's what we're, we're to do, and he shares this, this plan. But what do we understand from Ephesians chapter 1 in terms of the church, which is his body? Here's what we learn and know and are reminded that the church, or literally the called out ones or the called out assembly, is the body of Christ of which he is the head. This is why this gateway, which we're only talking about us, but it really every, every Bible-believing Christian church, but this is why this is his church, not Tom's church. You should say amen to that, and you should be really happy about that and really grateful for that. This is his church, not my church, and it's not your church. This is his church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. Christ is the head. So when the statement was shared with me through some members of Gateway, attendees of Gateway, what what they were told was the efforts of some other people that we are going to shut Gateway down. This was not an attack against you and it was not an attack against me. This was an attack against the one, capital O, whose body it is, Christ, the head of the church. And by the way, I would just, I didn't say this last gathering, but that's a really dangerous place to be if that's a position one takes. This is his body. This is his church. The church is the body of Christ, and every follower of Jesus is a part of of his body. And this is the beautiful picture because we are made up of individual parts and we're a a part of his body. We're part of the whole. That's a beautiful thing that you and I make up the body of Christ. And as we mature in Christ, we become, we, we come to understand that individually and collectively, we understand our purpose in the world is to share the good news of the gospel or the gospel story. Our purpose in the world as individual believers or followers of Jesus and as part of his body, the church, is to share the good news of the gospel. Now, just in case you're sitting here thinking like, well, what role do I have or what part do I have? Every follower of Jesus is a part of this body. Many of you are familiar with the passage of 1 Corinthians. Paul speaks. He says this, for just as a body is one, right? It's Christ's body, uh, my body. This is one body. Liking it to Christ's body now has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ, his body. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So together we make up the body of Christ. We have individual gifts, individual talents. Um, um, We bring different experiences. We bring all of these things together and we make up the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you and dwells in me? So believers are joined together as the church, the family of God. His spirit 
dwells in us and our mandate is given to us by Jesus. We are commissioned by him individually and collectively. So we live under the mandate as a body of believers, as a church, individually and collectively. We live under this mandate that's shared in Matthew chapter 28 to go into all of the world and make disciples. Here's what it says. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the mission and this is the passion that we're to live with. This is, this is why we exist as a church to share the gospel story, to go into all the world and make disciples and to glorify God. That is it right there. It's not to be um, YouTube famous, IG famous, not to be any of that stuff at all. We exist for one purpose and that's to share the gospel story with people. And we don't exist for our individual needs. Uh Uh-huh. Listen to this, Carrie Newoff, a church that meets all your needs is probably off mission. I'm going to say it again. The church that meets all of your needs is probably off mission. So what does that mean to you and me? Well, we, we come in, right? Um, and, and we go, like, I, I, um, I want the uh, worship to be this way. I want the lights to be this way. I want the carpet to be this way. I want this, uh, here's my needs. I have this need, I have this need, I have this need. And the role of the church is to meet my needs. No, it's not. The role of this church is not to meet your individual needs and not to meet my individual needs and to make sure you go away really, really happy. Now, I I get it that, um, so depending on who you listen to, like maybe this isn't the way to grow a church. I don't know. But I'm just telling you, we are here for one purpose. It, doesn't, it isn't to meet my personal need, and it isn't to meet your personal need outside of worshiping Jesus and glorifying him. Here's the bottom line. I don't like everything we do either. <laughs> and you don't either. But that's not why we gather, to make ourselves happy. This church will disappoint you. If you feel it's about anything other than serving Jesus and living out our mission in the world, if you think it's about anything else, I guarantee we will disappoint you and I will disappoint you. It will happen because it's a wrong focus. It's just like the story at the start. Look, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. That's why we gather and we can never, ever lose that passion because the... um, the moment that we lose the passion, the moment we begin, we stop seeing lost people. The moment we lose why we gather and why we're here to worship Jesus and to glorify him and to lift him up is the moment we don't see the world as Jesus sees the world, as he died for the world, that he died for sinners. And here's, how do we stay on mission? How do we keep this focus in front of us? Here's how it happens. We remember this and we understand this. The church, Christ's body, who is Christ's body? Us. Is the manifest presence of God in the world today and called to share the gospel of story, the gospel story with all. We are the manifest presence of God to the world today. So when you're out in your workplace, When you're in the coffee shop, wherever you go, when you're in the grocery store, you are part of the body of Christ. You're God's manifest presence in the world today as an individual follower of Jesus and as a collective body of believers here called Gateway. And we have a passion. We must live with a passion to share this gospel story, story, this good news with the world today. This is why the church is under attack today. And I'm not just talking about gateway. I'm just talking about wherever the name of Jesus is lifted up. And those attacks will continue, but we must not be distracted by whatever level of persecution comes. And it will, and it will be personal, and it will be as a, as a body of Christ. It will, it will come. It's amazing to me um, when I was just reflecting on the church worldwide where people are dying for their faith. 
People are being killed for their faith. A number of weeks ago, I showed you a list of the top 10 countries where persecution is at its highest. But, but believers are still gathering, and they're gathering um, under the threat of losing their life and their church being attacked. But what amazes me is even under those circumstances, they still seek to gather together because that's what we do. And we gather together to worship Jesus and to glorify him. We don't know persecution. Just read the stories. We don't know. Does it come? Well, it come, I, don't, I don't know. But I do know this, that, that the Bible says that you'll be hated for my namesake, Matthew chapter 10, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus is teaching his disciples um, that they'll experience persecution for preaching the gospel or for standing firm on, on the word of God, for sharing this story. But the disciples are not, not to be anxious about that, and nor are they to back away from that. They're not to be anxious because the Spirit of God will speak through them as they carry this story. But what Jesus is teaching his disciples, I believe by extension, is what we are to expect as well, that we will suffer some type of persecution, but it should not and it cannot deter us from this passion of sharing the good news of the gospel with people that you're around and people that you work with and people that you rub shoulders with, that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Savior. And there is a final destination for every person in the world today. It's with him or it's without him. But let me ask you this, does sometimes life... It, uh, let me start. Sometimes life gets in my way and I lose that. And I think that's probably true for every, every one of us, right? We're experiencing life and we kind of lose our purpose and we lose our, the mission that Jesus has, has called us to. And so what does the Bible say? The Bible says, this is who you are and this is your purpose. So how does that form for my beliefs? So let me, let me just kind of walk through this really, really quick. So my beliefs are formed by what the Bible says. I believe that Christ is the head of the church and I am a member of his body. I believe that the church, the called out ones, must be different from the world in which we live to reach the world from which we live. There's a problem if the church looks just like the world today. There's a problem. If you can't tell the difference between the church, if you're an individual follower of Jesus or us here, if you can't tell the difference, there's a problem. The church must be different from the world in which we live to reach the world in which we live. We must be people of hope. I believe I am different to make a difference. I was going to have you just turn to your neighbor and go like, you're really different today, but we won't do that. Um, Paul uses the word peculiar in one version, right? You're a peculiar person. We are, we are different in order to make a difference. So when you go out into the world today, wherever you go, people ought to see a difference. Now, the Bible says, Peter says, like, be ready to give an answer for that hope that lies in you, because I believe that people can see hope in us, even if we don't speak a word. They can see it, right? You're smiling, you're happy about something and all the world's falling around you. Go like, why are you so happy? It's because you have the hope of Jesus in you. So I am different to make a difference. I believe that the spirit lives in me and where he goes, where I go, he goes. The spirit lives in me. So my beliefs are formed by the Bible. I believe I am part of the purpose of God in the world today. So when your feet hit the ground tomorrow, or you go home today, you do so and I do so knowing that I am a part of the manifest presence of God in the world today. And I am a part of his purpose in the world today. The person I connect with, the group of people I connect with, I have a purpose in life. And that is to share this gospel story through my behavior, how I live and how I act. So my beliefs are formed by what the Bible says. My values are formed by my beliefs. So just think about that next circle um, that we have put up there. I value my relationship with the one who gave his life for me. I value the Bible, the inspired word of God given to me. And if I value the Bible, I will immerse myself in the Bible. I value the Bible. <clears throat> I value meeting together to worship God in large and small groups like this, and then in small groups, right? Because you can't live life in isolation. We are not called to do that. Nowhere in the Bible are we to live out our life 
alone unless Jesus puts you there for some reason. We are called to do life together, not in isolation. That's why we gather together. We are connected to the head and then we're connected to the body. And to be anything, for those who say, look, all I have is Jesus, I'm just connected to the head, I don't need his church. I, I, th that is not just different, but that is weird. You can't do that. You cannot be connected to the head without being connected to the body. That's why there's so much in the Bible about how we live out the body of Christ. We're to be connected to one another. I value the gifts given to others to help me grow. We value the gifts in the body of Christ. The moment I say, I don't know, I don't need you is the moment I say, all I need is me, and that's pride. The moment I say, I don't need you, I don't need this person, I don't need the church today, is a moment like, all I need is me, and that's pride. I value the gifts given, uh, given uh, me to help others serve. That's each and every one of you. Like God's gifted you to help some, someone else. We serve others. And I value the call to go into all of the world today. What about my behavior formed by my values? I'm going to break this into two sections. So what is my behavior? How is my behavior formed by the Bible, by my beliefs, and by my, my values? And I'm going to break it into two sections. Number one, in community, and then in the community. First, in the community, meaning outside the church. So you've been around for a while. Maybe it's your first time here. I refer to Gateway as a faith community. So we'll talk about what's my behavior in community amongst ourselves. But first, what's my behavior to be in the community? In the community. We're to love as Jesus loved. And while Jesus confronted sin as an act of love, he did so in truth and grace. Now, we're going we're gonna to kind of um, tease that out a little bit more in this next series called Following Jesus. How did he do that? That's what we're going to learn. But Jesus confronted sin as an act of love, and he did so in truth and grace. But we are confronted with something today, each and every one of us, as we purpose to live this out in the community that's outside the walls of the church, and it's this thing called tolerance. And so is that love? Is tolerance the same as love? And I'm going to suggest, and while I understand most of the aspects of tolerance, like we all do, I, I'll tolerate some ill behavior of my kids, but when my kids are growing up, I would not tolerate or accept things that would bring them harm in their life. That's something that we're not allowed, and I'm just not going to tolerate. So I, I, I get all that, but is the call for tolerance in the way that we're hearing today, is that love? And I'm just going to say, I don't think it is. And for us to be effective witnesses of the gospel, seeking and praying for hearts to be changed by Jesus, we must understand that there's a difference between the tolerance that we are sometimes called to and the love that Jesus commands us to, to live in. No one says it better um, than, I believe, John um, um, uh, Bevere. Um, and I'm going to read it how he states it because I think he really brings clarity to this issue and the difference between the tolerance that we are called to today and the love that we're to live with as a follower of Jesus. John Bevere says this, he says, Jesus warns the church in Thyatira against tolerance, which was leading them into immorality and idolatry. Our culture often confuses love and tolerance. The two couldn't be more different. Love seeks the other person's good, Tolerance seeks to be thought of as good in another person's eye. eyes. Love comes from fearing God. Tolerance comes from fearing man. Nowhere in Scripture is tolerance held up as a virtue, just as a reminder to anchor your values in God's word, not in the world's broken system. So there's a difference. Now, what's going on in Thyatira, in this church in Revelation that we're being warned about? Um, that generated this warning against tolerance. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, 
and 26 through 26, but I have this against you that you, that you tolerate or you, you put up with, you accept, or you allow, you allow, you're allowing this in your, to your community. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. So you're, you know, for our purposes, then tolerance becomes defined as accepting. So you're accepting this teaching into your community and it's leading people astray into sexual immorality and into food sacrifice to idols. Apparently it was teaching, this teaching, because tolerance was leading them this direction. It was acceptable to that local society, but abhorred by Christ. It was taking them away from what the what we were called how we're called to live if if this was a teacher in today's world it it might look like this um you've heard the word influencer um she would be an influencer right maybe with a million um uh, ig followers tiktok youtube um <clears throat> any other other social media outlets and she would be called an influencer because she's leading people astray what was happening is there was there was tolerance, it was like almost an acceptance of what was going on. Let me ask you a question. What would have, what would have happened if love demanded loving confrontation as we learned from Jesus? How many would have potentially been rescued from acts of sexual immorality or idolatry? We can, we, we can only wonder ab about that. So are you, do you see the difference between the two? We are to be people who love as Jesus love, but we're not to be people accepting of sin um, that Jesus condemns. Jesus confronted sin as an act of love and truth and grace. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses, uh, verses 3 and 4, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have, having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths that that's happening and I think we're seeing it today. So we have a role in the community to love as Jesus loved with truth and grace and that oftentimes calls us to confront sin as Jesus confronted sin in the way that Jesus confronted sin. So how about in the community and we're gonna wrap up here pretty quickly. Um, what, what about my behavior toward my fellow believers in the Lord? So this may be even more difficult for you and for me, right? Because we come together and, uh, you know, like the Bible says, here's the deal. You got to bear with one another or you have to put up with each other because like, like someone ticked you off and someone, someone made you feel bad about something. The Bible says you got to just bear with one another. In other words, give people space. So maybe it's even harder in in community than is in the community for, for, for some of us. My behavior toward my fellow believers in the Lord is to be a witness to the outside world as they look in. Let me tell you this, the world is looking in. So they're seeing you and me in this community, this part of Kitsap County, right? This, this is why I think it's so critical that we understand what, what the Bible is calling us to, uh, to be. When, when people drive by here, just the visual of you being here, you know, online campus, YouTube, but just the visual of you being here is saying something to this community. We value gathering together. And I pray that what they see in our community life is reflective of Jesus. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Now, it doesn't say this, a new suggestion I give to you that you love one another. It doesn't say that. It says that this is a commandment that you love one another. It's not even a, it's not a good idea. It's something that we are to do. How? Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one How did Jesus love you? He died for us, right? He gave up his life for you and for, he died for us. So like in this same way, you love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples for you have love for one another. So let me just say it this way, paraphrase it. 
Like, as you live out your life, knowing that you have been forgiven by Jesus, and you live out that kind of love to one another, your behavior will be seen by others outside, and they will know that you have love for one another and love for Jesus. Your behavior and my behavior toward one another. This new commandment given to the leaven and to, to you and to me was critical for survival and will be a, a, a new kind of love for the disciples and by extension, you and me. Not based on how good we are or maybe how good we, we, we look, but on the sacrificial love of Jesus only. As I loved you, you must love one another. The behavior that reflects our beliefs and our values, the world sees in the church and must be different than what is seen in the world. The church is to be a loving community where people sense community or belonging, where we grow together and all members are actively involved in this mission of Jesus. This is the community that Jesus uses to change the world. And it begins right here locally, that's you and that's me. And that's why the enemy is working so hard to cause division amongst us. Gateway is not a perfect church. I've said that before. Um, you will be disappointed and you will be hurt because we're imperfect people coming together trying to work this thing out. But what covers all that is our love for Jesus and our love for one another. Dave Platt says this, when people in the world see the life of Christ in the church, they will bleed the love of God for the world. When people in the world see the life of Christ in the church, they will believe the love of God for the world. In community, we live out the commands of the Bible and others see that. Let me tell you just a closing story. I know I've gone, I'm gone over just a little bit today and I wanna say I'm sorry for that, but I'm actually not, I would be lying to you. So, but let, let me tell you this story real quick. I, this past week, I was on my way to a meeting in Bremerton and uh, I stopped by my mother's final resting place, her grave, where she is. And so mom is there, her twin brother is here, there. Um, my grandma and my gran grandfather, my aunt um, and my uncle, these are all that I would consider heroes of the faith, particularly my mom. Um, and if you don't know my story, I, 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 most do, um, I was raised by a single mom, so all five of us were. So mom raised all five of us. Um, I don't remember exactly the year that mom became a believer, but it was after we moved here. I don't remember that because I was too young. We moved to Bremerton. But w one of the first things my, my mother did is she took us to church, all five of us. And I experienced something then as a young guy growing up and then into my, my teen years, I experienced this thing called the church. It wasn't a perfect church. In fact, my mom was hurt pretty bad one time and um, the church at that time, this goes back, of course, a number of years, they were voting if, if they would allow a divorced person to be a member of the church. And of course, my mom was divorced. We were a single parent family. And so she had to walk through those emotions. But here's what I want to tell you. My mom never walked away from the church. She got hurt. But she never walked away. She valued the church, and you know that same, they, they decided not to go down that pathway. But here's what happened. This church, this local body of believers gathered around this family of six and provided for us in ways I, I know I don't even know today. I know prayed for us, um, gave themselves up, up for this young family. Um, um, now it cost hundreds of dollars for our students to go to camp and um, it wasn't quite that much then, but this church gathered and I don't know, people paid for our way to camp. And it was at camp that I gave my life to Jesus. You see what happens when the church is the church? People are helped. People are, are ministered to, you know, our churchy word, right? People are loved in a way that draws other people in. What a tremendous opportunity that we have to gather together and to, and to be the church week after week after week and to say, like, I'm going to be a part of this body of Christ. I'm, I'm going to be 
part of carrying this gospel story to the world today, individually and collectively. So I just have one last thing to say to you. Can we stand together? And, uh, because here's my closing um, uh, admonition. It's, it's coming up on the screen. Here it is right here. Just be the church. Will you be the church? Will you commit this morning to being the church in community and being the church in the community? Will you commit to being the church and loving one another um, in the way that Jesus loved us? That means sometimes we're going to bear with one another. Will you commit to being the church in community? And will you commit to being the church in the community? Because this community needs you. And this community needs me. This community needs us to be passionate about sharing the good news of the gospel because Jesus is our only hope. Amen. Be the church. Will you do that? Amen.